Well, there's a tradition from Sartre, developing from Sartre in France, called French voluntarism. According to voluntarism, it doesn't matter what you choose as long as you choose something. So, does the man in the yellow wood, are we told frost by frost what he's choosing? No. I said he might be choosing to marry Jane or Mary, or maybe to go to America or remain in Europe. These are all possible choices. But also, he might be choosing whether or not to kill someone or torture someone. We're not told whether the choice is between good or evil, or between two, two evil courses. Now, according to the tradition of French voluntarism, it doesn't matter whether you choose good or evil, as long as you make a choice, those choices are equally authentic. In a 1984 novel by a man by the name of Tim Crabb, Tim Crabb, there's a man called Raymond, who discovers as, he, as a teenager that he's capable of great goodness because he dives into a lake and saves a little girl from drowning. And he begins to wonder, what well, if I'm capable of acts of goodness, am I capable of acts of great evil? So, he kidnaps a woman and buries her alive. According to the theory of French voluntarism, these are equally, equally authentic, valid choices. In fact, if I choose to do good things, if I choose only to do good things, I cannot know whether I am choosing or merely obeying the commands of society. Society says, do not steal, and I choose not to steal. I tell myself that I am acting freely. How can I know? I can only know that I'm acting freely when I choose to go against society's edicts and laws, when I choose to steal despite the fact that everyone tells me not to. Now, if this is true, then it is possible to read Frost's poem as a very anti-ideological text. Because I've been saying from Marx, with the Marxist glasses on, I've been saying that this is a, a text which is a, performing a consolatory function, inviting you to be comfortable, or at least more comfortable, with your position as an individual unit of waged labour in the capitalist mode of production. But if we read the poem as justifying acts of evil, as long as they are freely chosen, then there is no way that we can continue to maintain the case that the poem is ideological. Therefore, in finishing today, I would like to say that depending on which pair of glasses we put on, we can see the road less, less travelled as an ideological or counter-ideological text. But I think that we also have to understand that if we're putting these pairs of glasses on, we can't really put on our Marxist glasses and our existentialist glasses at the same time. At least the work of reconciling Marxism with existentialism has not successfully been achieved yet. So you have to choose. I'm saying that as a critic, you need to choose between whether you're going to see texts as performing a social, a social function or, or imagine texts or choose to see texts as abstract and speaking to a form of humanity that is trans-historical, trans-cultural, and fundamentally not simply a product of social conditions. So today I hope to have introduced the idea of ideology to you, to have given you some interesting ideas about the road not taken, and to have contextualized the poem and the theory of ideology in the history of literary criticism and the development of Western civilization as represented by Marx. Thank you for listening.